Welcome back to the History Hour with Mr. Kent and Professor White. We will be continuing our discussion of Mesopotamia. You are listening to Episode 3, where we will be discussing the period after the Akkadians, after the Third Dynasty of War, and getting into Hammurabi and what came before and after him. So, as I promised last episode, we will once again discuss the episodes that came directly before this one, specifically Episode 2 and 2.5. One of the first things I want to bring up is the fact that we missed a couple details here and there. Uh, in the episode, we kind of repeated an old rumor about Napoleon's troops shooting a cannon, knocking the nose off the Sphinx. Apparently someone else did that. It, ha- it happened sometime in the past. And the thing is, we're not experts. This isn't our even main area of research. We're journalists, and we're enthusiast amateurs as far as sort of historical podcasting goes. We're going to try to catch these you know, errors, repeat rumors as often as we can, and let you know as soon as we can. If, you, if we miss something and you catch it, feel free to yell us in the comments, and we'll correct it maybe. Since we discussed it so thoroughly in the last two episodes, I want to go back to the Sumerian King List just a little bit and kind of give more detail to an amateur, someone who isn't that familiar with the subject, about exactly how the accuracy of these this list can be so in question, how it can be so disputed, and the historians are just not sure who goes where and whatnot. Imagine a scenario. Imagine if in the early dynastic period, before the rise of Sargon, when you had these many states clashing with each other, imagine you had two powers, say Lagash and Ur in this case. For both major powers, they control multiple city-states around them, they have several generations of kings, and both of them say, I'm the biggest, baddest king in Sumer. Well, which king list do we use? Is it is it one of those periods where it just says there are a bunch of kings and they're not listed? Well, those two kings are probably actually listed by name in various lists. Do you trust the Ur list? Do you trust the Lagash list? Do you trust some third-party list? Like, which, which dynasty trying to legitimize itself do we put in as the official one? And the, if the third one does have a stated king, or like, oh, this is the most trustworthy because it's not part of propaganda, is it going to be accurate? Is City going to be recording the dates and the years that they reigned out of misremembered rumor? Are they going to be trying to shorten it to elevate their own king? Like, there's, there's a lot of questions here about who intended what when, who's trustworthy, which things are just repeated stories, who is trying to bolster their own legend. We talked about the idea of Sharo King meaning Jim of King or Shar Kali Shari meaning King of Kings. There's a lot of games being played here. And so when you when you end up with Assyriologists and archaeologists and whatnot digging up all these tablets and cross referencing them, some agree, some don't, some outright disagree with each other. It's a lot of guessing and a lot of connecting the dots and that's how you end up with a lot of these question marks and is it did he reign for 50 years, or he reign for 35 years, or did he reign for 270 years? Probably not 270, but which the other two is better, we don't know. That's an issue not just with the Sumerian king, but with historical documents in general, because really until the fairly recently, historians, if you want to call them that, weren't really writing history with an idea of being accurate in mind. They were recording events for a reason, and that reason might have been political, it might have been economic, you never really know. So one of the great challenges of a historian is you look at a document, no matter what it is, you have to ask yourself not just what it says, but who wrote it, why did they write it, what purpose was it meant to serve. Because really, until maybe the 16th century, you know, in the current time, historians weren't writing for the purpose of actually recording the real, accurate history. And that's a whole other level of complexity in the graphs. And really, this is just sort of looking at the way the people writing it and the people who are reading it and discovering it are interpreting it. There's a lot more ways that these results and these records can be skewed. Take, for example, the way American history is taught. If you have a class full of American students who are being taught this myth, or not myth, but taught this history, there's a lot more focus in different areas. What we call the French Indian War was in reality this big spanning seven years war that the rest of the world remembers for very different reasons. Our War of 1812 was kind of a sideshow for the Napoleonic Wars. I met British people who'd never even heard of the conflict. And when you look at World War II throughout high school, most of the class I went through, there was a lot of talk about D-Day this, Marvin Garden that, North Africa, Battle of the Bulge, when in reality, 
the most brutal body counts. The bulk of the fighting was happening in the Eastern Front, Leningrad, Stalingrad, and also in Asia. The, the atrocities of Japanese command against the Chinese, simply because of the way our teachers decided to tell it, because of the way their teachers or their textbooks or wherever it told it, and what they thought was important to that crowd, we skipped over vast segments of a very important narrative in many, many cases. The same, too, can be said here. There could be interpretations throughout the ages that shaped what was recorded, what was saved, what people considered important, that the people they were writing about probably had different ideas of what the most important thing was. But really, I don't think that Sargon, or certainly not Sargon's soldiers, or the warriors who fought for Hammurabi, were thinking about what people would think about them in a few thousand years. They had much more real concerns. In reality, warfare is not entirely restricted to humans. Scientists have observed chimpanzees waging war upon each other. Various bands will essentially encounter one another, and not that commonly, but it has been observed before, that they'll essentially try to massacre them. They'll take over the ranging and gathering areas, they'll kill off the other tribe or incorporate the few survivors, and the other ones will have to escape and abandon find new other locations to survive in. The same thing was likely true of countless generations of pre-modern humans, Erectus, Nerithal, Halibrigensis, etc., etc., and surely was the same for early human throughout the Stone Age. The main factor when it comes to conflict, even large organized conflict like warfare in the Animal Kingdom and among these early humans, was most likely survival. Either they were threatened either by other sorts of humans or by natural predators, you either had to fight them in order to ensure they did not kill you, or you had to fight for the acquisition of resources. Resource wars still happen today. It's not as though the, the idea of fighting for survival has gone away. And in many ancient sieges and medieval sieges, I'm sure the defenders of castles and walled cities thought, if I don't hold this from the besiegers, I am going to die. So many people throughout history, regardless of period, I'm sure, fought in the moment because they thought they would die if they did not fight. However, this era does get to a point, and it, it occurred beforehand too, but certainly in this period, the absolute resource scarcity is not the main contributing factor. Most times when individuals go to war, it's essentially for personal gain. When, when a king, when an emperor, general goes to war, they typically do so because they want to gain territory, or they want to gain glory, or they want to subdue another city, make a vast or eliminate them from threat. It's essentially to build their own power, build their own prestige, and increase it. With more conquest comes more spoils, more territory, and can make you even more powerful, make you even more able to conquer elsewhere. The soldiers on the ground most often would not get a slice there. If they did, it would be a relatively small slice. Instead, the soldier, whether they be conscripted or volunteered, and often groups like the Amorites and later Cassites were described as pastoral nomads, were often seen as fairly adept in ways of warfare because they already tend to struggle over the actual use of land, and so one tribe will fight another for the use of grazing land or even for herds. And so it's a sort of piece, part of their society, whereas uh, cell people usually have a more structured lifestyle bound by laws and serving a king, etc., etc. It's less internecine violence in order to make, it, make your living, more or less, whereas that could be a real concern. And what you see a lot in this period, and much after, you get a portion of spoils. If the city falls and you're part of the attacking army, what you take, whether it be treasures or money or slaves, part of it's going to be yours. Uh, the, the old school style of encouraging people to join the military was essentially when the wall falls, everyone gets a share of the spoils. Everyone gets to burn and pillage, and if the people inside don't want that to happen, they should surrender early. It's not so unlike what you still see today in some uh, of the more violent war-torn areas of the world where warlords and bush wars continue and essentially is really a struggle for what can you gain in competition. Whereas before, you might have had to fight for survival, now you fight because that might give you an advantage over your neighbors. It might be, it could very well be a shortcut to go and take someone else's hard work rather than put in the hard work you yourself have done. Now later, when we get to the period like the Assyrians and certainly the Romans and modern day, everyone is likely somewhat familiar with the idea of professional armies, standing armies. These would have been armies where the soldier would have been for sure a full-time profession, would have been paid, they would have been trained. When you have 
civilizations that actually have standing armies, where they encourage people to join up, and that becomes their profession, and you have a sizable one. Those you typically see regular pay, and so people join for a job to get the money for stability. And also, you have concepts like patriotism, duty, and nationalism. And those certainly play a part somewhat here. The pride of being a Sumerian or a Akkadian or even an Amorite was most likely a very strong motivating factor, but it probably would not have had the same rhetoric, the same sort of state-backed narrative, the way that more modern armies often talk about for king and country or for homeland and duty or for the people we fight for back home. Sometime between the years 2020 and 2000 BCE, the third dynasty of Ur, or Ur III as we call it for short, comes to an end. And this is large as a result of internal dissent and rebellion, external pressures, the uh, variety of reasons lead to a collapse of internal unity and political power, and thus the empire comes apart. However, one major factor in this is the increased migration and movement of a group of people called the Amorites into this region. And the Amorites, again, not a unified group by any stretch of the imagination, but the combination of raiding and migration and outright conquest in some cases, they take advantage of this crumbling empire and they seize cities and territories for themselves. And ultimately they become the new power in the region and Earth will fade into history. The thing is though, if you've been paying attention, or if you're a student of this period yourself, you'll note that that's a story you've heard before. That's basically what the Akkadians had done centuries earlier. And again, if you're aware of the history of this region, it's going to happen again after them. You know, after the end of the Babylonian period, you see groups like the Kassites, then the Assyrians, then maybe the Medians and the Persians, and the cycles go on and on. In fact, you could argue that the movement of the Arabs in the 7th century CE is really just a continuation of this same pattern. If we see this numerous patterns of migrations, conquests, resettlements, the old nation or civilization collapses, falls apart, a new group of people come into the region and rebuild it, and establish a new nation, to repeat the same cycle again in a few centuries. What is going on here? Why is this happening here? And why is it happening so frequently? Well, this is something that uh, my professors, way back in my college days, called the Mesopotamian invasion cycle, because it's a cycle that repeats itself you know, every so many years, usually every couple of centuries, again and again and again. The reasons for it are complex, of course, because they always are. But to put it very simply, this is what happened. There is a strong impulse, you might say, a lure, if you will, to centralize and control the Mesopotamian River Valleys, to establish a single centralized state to govern over it. And the reason it's actually relatively simple, the motivation for these different groups to do this is power. If you can control the river valleys and the large populations and a large amount of fertile land there, then that equals power. Resource and populations means power in the Bronze Age. Mostly military power, but also economic power and social and cultural power as well. So the motivation to establish these large, large nations is pretty self-evident in those terms. However, establishing and maintaining a strong nation in Mesopotamia rests upon a razor's edge. In order to have an empire, a strong empire in this region, you have to have two things. One, you must have internal stability. Two, you must have external peace. What that means is you have to have everyone at least passively accepting your rule and not actively rebelling against you. And you have to have, if not actual peace with your neighbors, at least a certain degree of indifference or the ability to threaten them or suppress them enough militarily that they can't seriously challenge you. Now, a civilization can survive one of those things. You know, how about Sargon of Akkad putting rebellions down near his death? Or, you know, clashes with foreign kings and nations, like the raids of Anatolia and the like. Both of those conditions can never be met permanently. Eventually, again, due to a combination of desire for resources and land, or just the fact that there is a lot of internal resistance to these kinds of large central states, eventually both are going to happen at the same time. You're going to have a period of internal disunity, and you're going to have a period of external warfare, and once that happens, it's basically done for. 
So before we get into the full details of Babylon, let's talk a little bit about the ultimate fate of Ur. After the end of the Ur III dynasty, it shrinks somewhat in power and influence, but it still remains an economically and somewhat politically and culturally powerful city-state. It falls to Hammurabi's conquests, and it changes hands again and again to the usual cast of characters, Akkadians, Elamites, Kassites, and finally Assyrians. During one of the interim periods, it joins up with others to form a sort of neo-Neo-Sumerian empire, the Sealandites. Ur itself never becomes a prominent capital of a state like it once was. Instead, it changes hands, remains prominent, but by the time of the Persian conquest of Mesopotamia, it is in severe decline, and within 100 years of Persian occupation, the city is more or less uninhabited and becomes forgotten over the centuries. And in fact, Ur is not really discovered ever again until modern archaeology unearths in the last few centuries. And what we found there in the Royal Cemetery of Ur, as we discussed in previous episodes, was very elaborate and gave us a lot of insights into what that period and previous periods are actually like. Unfortunately, in the modern era, some of these treasures, as well as the pretty incredibly preserved ziggurat of Ur, compared to many of the other ancient megastructures, have been damaged, especially since the U.S. occupation of Iraq. So who are these Amorites that come to dominate the next section of history? The earliest Sumerian references seem to be from tablets that claim they control all lands west of the Euphrates. Once again, we're looking at people who claim the whole world is about the size of Belgium, so, you know. But supposedly the mythic founder of Uruk had to construct a wall to keep them out. Also, they fought the Achaean emperors, and Shu Sen built a wall to keep them out. In both cases, largely unsuccessful. We'll talk a little bit more about walls and their unsuccess in the light round. The Sumerians themselves characterized them as a sort of nomadic, uncivilized people, something that if you've taken a course, most likely you've heard the term pastoral nomads, those people who wander the areas in semi settled fashion, basically maintain herds, being usually pretty good at warfare. There's a particularly amusing tablet that was found in Akkadian times that said that an Amorite would not know wheat if shown it. They seem to lack complex agriculture and urbanization, but they seem to have known how warfare happened, and they seem to have been pretty adept at it, and they seem to have already established themselves with chieftains. Seemingly, the area they came out originally was the Palestinian Syrian area, and they spoke some sort of Semitic language, likely a relative to Canaan. These groups are referenced briefly in the Old Testament. The Jews of Israel had conflicts with them before they eventually shifted the Amorite power more to the west, to the Sumerian regions. During the Ur III era, there was a crisis, likely a drought, which is also speculated to have been related to the fall of the, both the Akkadian Empire and the Indus. Harappan civilization in India. This or a drought and the scarcity of resources pushed them from the coast, the areas around Judea, Palestine, Phoenicia, and moved them toward the more irrigated and more fertile, fertile crescent. After leaving the regions around Canaan and Judea, they first had north, essentially the areas we now would recognize as Syria, and they established a number of chieftains and kingdoms, most notably Yamhad in modern-day Aleppo and Katna around the Damascus region. They also rebuilt Mari after the collapse of the Shakanaku dynasty, and it was the capital of a fairly powerful Syrian Amorite state. As well, you had other regional powers such as Shamshi Adad, who ruled an Amorite dynasty in Syria and then destroyed Mari again. That state was fairly powerful, though fairly brief in the grand scheme of things. And it's interesting to consider, like, had things gone a little bit different, these first areas the Amorites moved into, Mari and Assyria, had things gone a little bit different, might they have become sort of the cultural and political cornerstone of the next era to come instead of that? So, during this period, it's immediately after the collapse of the Earth III, and immediately after the Amorite migration into Mesopotamia proper, moving as far south as the existing, if not major, city of Babylon, you see this brief period, I'm calling the transitional period, in which there was no real one dominant power in Mesopotamia or beyond. Yes, the Amorites are the new power in the region, but they're divided between a half a dozen different kingdoms and chieftains by subsets. Now, when you look at the actual political situation before Hammurabi's rise brings Babylon to the forefront, there's actually a broad number of contenders who all are basically staking their claim of being the new king of the world, to use a phrase they like to use so much in ancient days. Now, in the south, 
in the old Sumeri Akkad region. The two big contenders were actually a couple of very old, but up to that point, relatively minor cities, though they had you know, reference to the king's list a few times. Isin and Larsha. These two states are going to clash really for the next 200 years back and forth. Now, both of these are old cities with old ties to Sumerian culture, dating back really to the early, early dynastic period and probably even beyond that. However, it is you know, telling to note that while these two cities had struggled to control the south and dominate both the rivers and the coast of the Persian Gulf, when Larsha is ultimately overrun and rebuilt by Amorites, it goes from being a pure power with Isin to being dominant power in the south. And over the course of about a decade, much no, several decades in case, the Larsha slowly begins to drive Isin back. And by 1924 BCE, Larsha's on the verge of actually dominating Sumeria. Indeed, around that time, Babylon, which Hammurabi has not yet come to pass very early in the Babylonian Amorite dynasty, actually was so concerned with Larsha, Babylon began to form a coalition against Larsha. In addition to this, within a century of its near dominance of the south, the Elamites will actually invade. Interestingly enough, the Elamites actually win this war, and they'll become the new power in the south for a time. In fact, there's two kings of Larsha, Warad-Sin and Rim-Sin, Telling to note, these are two Elamite kings who have Akkadian names, so that's a reference to how strong Sumerian culture pride actually were. Uh, the last of these, Rim Sin, will actually defeat the Babylonian coalition in battle, and for a brief couple of years, make a really strong case for being the king of the world. Isthan and Larsha aren't the only contenders. I mentioned Mari before, this state that emerges sort of in on the Sort of halfway between Mesopotamia and Syria, or this gateway city. Now, Mari, as a significant city state, had existed for quite some time, and it exists at a very important strategic location, basically controlling one of the major overland routes into Syria proper. And if you recall from earlier episodes, Syria is the gateway also to central Turkey, or Anatolia as it was called, which is the major source of stone, timber, silver, copper, bronze, and other very vital materials. Mari basically was in a very strong economic position. Well, Mari had been conquered in Akkadian times and incorporated into the Akkadian Empire. Legends say that Sargon himself did the conquering. It might have been him, also might have been one of his sons or grandsons, but it was done. We do know that Mari was an outpost of the Akkadians. One of the fun facts of why we know that, the Shakanaku dynasty takes their name from the fact that the actual title of king in Mari was Shakonaku, which is an old Akkadian word that was given to military commanders who were sent to rule the city in the king's name, so thus a tie to the old Akkadian state. But after the fall of Ur-3, Amorites from the relatively minor nation of Hana move into the area and by their own account liberate Mari from the Akkadian yoke, though how true is that? It's by war conquest, but they do rebuild the city. And in fact, by 1820 BCE, so around the time that you know, Larsha is really beginning to roll with a major power, Mari becomes one of the great jewels of the West as far as ancient city state is concerned. From this period, archaeologically, we can look at things like the construction of large and elaborate temples in the city, the building of the royal library, which is a massively significant archaeological find in the period. New walls built on the city and mass irrigation and land reclamation products vastly expanded the city's population economic power. In fact, around this time, the new Amorite-ruled Mari actually began to subdue the surrounding region and force a variety of local cities, villages, and tribes to pay tribute to them. And using both its strategic position and its newfound military might, it basically monopolized trade with Syria and grew extremely wealthy off controlling and taxing that trade. Unfortunately, as Mari would soon learn, success often breeds contempt and also breeds rivals. And in fact, you know, very soon other cities will take challenge them as Syria ultimately conquers them. But for a brief shining moment, Mari becomes this grand power in the north. And one of the most significant things about it for us is that archaeologically speaking, when the city was found, it was majorly impacted 
The Royal Library, not perfectly complete, but hundreds upon hundreds of preserved tablets were found there. Interestingly enough, we think they probably survived because, spoiler, when Hammurabi burns the city, we think the fire actually fired the clay and preserved the tablets in the library. Not only does this archive have access to literature, mythology, government records, also large amounts of personal correspondence, letters dictated by the king or his officials, correspondence with foreign kings, with letters to Hammurabi, in fact, in there. Which, uh, again, someone made a miscalculation there because one of the tablets actually says, the man of Babylon, Hammurabi, would never do my lord harm. Not that many years later that Hammurabi does Mari a lot of harm, but... Whoops-a-daisy. Whoops-a-daisy, indeed. So Mari is becoming this economic uh, military power in Israel. With others in the world as well. The city of Eshnuna, also one of the more northern uh, Sumerian states, which had cultivated political and economic ties to Elam, which, on the one hand, pretty clever, because Elam's a powerful contender, but also an old enemy of the Mesopotamians, and those connections are going to do Eshnuna some harm later on. Eshnuna, like Mari, had been part of a larger Mesopotamian nation before this. In fact, we I'm pretty confident that it's part of the Ur-3 kingdom. However, in the last years in which Ur-3 was failing, as far as we can tell, the local military commander of Eshnuna asked for permission to increase the garrison of the city against the Amorites. He was given permission to do this, and then immediately used that army to turn on his king and establish himself as the new king of Eshnuna. In these early decades of this, Eshnuna never really established itself as much power, until eventually, we're talking about, again, 2000, uh, 1800 BC, uh, BCE time. A king named Ipik Adad II comes to power in Eshnuna, and he leads Eshnuna into this very brief period of economic and military domination north. In fact, for a brief period of time, he turned Mari back and actually subdued and forced Asher to pay tribute to him. Here's the thing. Assyria is the major source of tin vital resource in making bronze, which meant that for a brief period of time, Eshnuna monopolized tin imports. And much as Mari had used trade with Anatolia to establish their power, so was Eshnuna doing the same thing. But Eshnuna is also a very short period. It will clash with their Amorite groups, and ultimately it will fall to the Assyrians as well. Which brings us to Asher itself. Now, Assyria, as it's famously known, is mostly named for its, cap its old capital of Asher, which was a city built in honor of the god, Asher. Not exactly the most creative of names, but you know, there you have it. Now, Asher is an old city. It dates back into early Sumerian times, though the earliest Sumerians would have called it a remote and primitive outpost at best. But Asher considered itself part of this long-standing ancient Sumerian tradition, even if well, as we mentioned before, the Amorites will settle in the region south dynasty there around 2000 BCE. In its earliest period, Assyria was actually the hub of a massive trade web. In fact, Asher sent out missions and established trade colonies all over the region. Tin mining in Afghanistan was probably at least, maybe not first conducted, but first massively monopolized by Assyrian merchants in the region. And we know the Assyrians established merchant colonies in central Turkey, which play a huge role in the rise of Hittite civilization. We'll get to the Hittites later on, I promise you. Which, again, if you know anything about the history of this region, you know that Assyria in centuries to come becomes this hyper-aggressive, bloody power. The fact that they rose to prominence as this hugely spanning trade nation seems a little incongruous. We'll get to that. I promise you that, too. For all of its success in establishing its influence economically, for being able to bring in these valuable metals, Assyria actually has a lot of bad luck. It built this sort of fairly prominent city-state in the north, and then Sargon kicked them really hard and forced them to get their lunch money. After Sargon's fall, Assyria breaks free and becomes independent, then the Ur-3 died, the same thing. Once Ur-3 falls apart, again, Amorites settle in the region, establish a new dynasty, and once again, Assyria becomes this hugely important economic power. It's eventually able to turn Eshnuna aside and break their power, and then eventually actually conquer Mari itself and become a dominant power in the north. And then Hammurabi punches them in the face repeatedly. Basically, Assyria has some bad luck in this period, to say the least. There's all these contenders for power. Larsha is unifying the south. 
Assyria is unifying the north. Mari tries to dominate the region economically. And yet, despite this, despite an evasion of the Elamites, despite a coalition of different powers fighting everyone else, it's a total dark horse who actually wins the fight to become the next king of the world. Prior to the coming of the Amorites, Babylon seemingly was a somewhat significant, somewhat economically important port town. It wasn't even quite in the same league as actual big city states, those with actual insane goals. Instead, it was an important but not prominent element of the Ur III dynasty, and possibly it had some origin for that. The oldest sections of Babylon have actually been largely silted up and swallowed by erosion, kind of like we talked about before, what could have happened with the entire city. And so as a result, the pre-walled city-state Babylon there's very little archaeological evidence. The Babylonians themselves seem to attribute the actual creation of Babylon, like its founding and whatnot, to Sargon, but once again, Sargon's figure looms large, and how much is history, how much is myth, eh, who knows. But the Babylonians, those Amorites who came to inhabit the city and turn into an actual power, they made some of their own mythology. When I was in college, the professor I had talked about some of the bleeding edge scholarship at the time were sort of contesting the actual difference between Babylonians and the earlier Sumerian Akkadian culture. In that, they were trying to prove that the Babylonian culture was not so different and the differences were more played up by these, this later era trying to distinguish themselves, trying to say, we're the new generation. When in reality, once the Amorites abandoned the sort of nomadic pastoralism, once they abandoned their northern chiefdoms and their non-agrarian ways and instead settled, their culture begins to look remarkably similar to the previous ones. And in a big way, Amorite Babylon is more or less Sumerian Akkadian Babylon with Amorites inside of it and who rule it. Alright, so if Babylon was a significant but not major player for a long time, well what changes? Well, partly it's the Amorite settlement establishing this, this city as a new power. Uh, but really, a lot of it does come down to one particular king. Around the year 1792 BCE, the king that you should all know, in Hammurabi, becomes king of Babylon. Or Hammurabi, if you want his actual proper Akkadian. Anyway, so Hammurabi will reign for a long time, about 42 years in fact, between roughly 1792 and 1750 BCE. And what makes Hammurabi's long reign interesting is this man really was a masterful schemer and politician, and if not himself a great military commander, at least able to recognize great military And he used those skills pretty expertly to divide and conquer his various rivals and ultimately unify what would be, at that point, the largest empire yet found in history. Hammurabi comes to the throne, now he's like the fifth or sixth king of the Amorite dynasty of Babylon, and his predecessors had laid the groundwork, and they'd established Babylon as a power player, they'd made alliances and a co anti larshan coalition against the Elamite kings down there with other prominent cities. But for the first five or so years of his reign, Hammurabi actually does relatively little. He spends that time stabilizing his throne, ensuring his political power is secure, dealing with a few rival claimants to his position, but ultimately he spends it observing. He wanted to get correspondence with Mari, indications that the Babylonians were not spying in the modern sense, but definitely keeping an eye on who was important, who had the biggest strategic advantages, who the biggest threats would be, and sort of making a plan around that. Now, I would argue that Hammurabi did not come to the throne with some grand vision of unifying everything like the get-go. That was likely an ambition of his, but more organic than that. Hammurabi was an expert at using the situation. One of the first things he does is actually approach the king of Mari at the time, a man named Zimri Lim. And he basically, to paraphrase, says to Zimri Lim, hey, these Elamites down in Larsha who've made this big state and have defeated uh, my ancestors' coalition, you know, they're a serious threat. They've raided Mesopotamia before. Let's join hands together. That's the phrase they use, to join hands with kings, and fight our common enemy. King of Mari's like, that's a pretty good idea. We're clashing with Eshnuna, 
they're aligned with the Elamite, this is a very serious problem. Let's work together to end this common threat. And we don't know specifically because the full treaty hasn't survived, but Professor of Mine suggested that the treaty as written was actually very clever in that it didn't specify Elam, it just said Mari aligns with Babylon to fight common enemies. Well, Hammurabi in particular would then somewhat cynically use this alliance to get Mari to help him crush his various political rivals because they were enemies of Babylon and therefore enemies of Mari. Is this just pure cynicism? Is it opportunism? Is it brilliant politics and action? It might be all three, but slowly but surely, with the help of Mari and with the help of Babylon's you know, not inconsiderable strategic position, Hammurabi begins to expand, and it begins to expand significantly. Again, 1787 BCE, five years of his reign, with his new alliance with Mari, he attacks and seizes the city of Isim, one of the minor powers that Marsha had pretty much destroyed with its rise to power earlier. Now, that's pretty significant, because now he has much more control over the rivers. He then begins to basically build a series of forts and fortify a number of villages along the Tigris and Euphrates, basically expanding strategically and ensuring strong Babylonian control over the major water routes north and south. This, of course, makes Larsha somewhat uncomfortable, and the two exchange some angry letters back and forth, but actually, it's something like 20 years before Larsha at last feels we cannot let this stand, we have to take action. So what happens is the uh, Kingdom of Arsha, the Kingdom of Babylon, go to war in 1763 BCE, and while by all accounts it is a difficult and brutal war, Larsha ultimately falls to Hammurabi's armies. Interestingly enough, though, this seems to really get the dominoes fall. Within two years, Hammurabi betrays Mari and conquers it as well. Now, the official story and correspondence is that around 1761 BCE, Hammurabi asks for Mari's aid against, I believe it was Eshinuna this time. Uh, Mari refused. Perhaps they found they'd grown tired of being used cynically in this alliance. Hammurabi then declared Mari to be a betrayer of alliances and a false friend, declared war on them and conquered them. Interestingly enough, Zimri Lim, who's still king of Mari at this time, it's kind of lucky. I guess Hammurabi liked him because his punishment was to surrender his crown, swear allegiance to Babylon, and become the new governor of Mari's name. Though within a decade of Zimri-Lim's death, uh, Mari would be torn to the ground and burned. So short-lived success there, but there you have it. Within five years of that, Hammurabi starts skirmishing with the Assyrians in the north. Now, unfortunately, the records of this are really spotty. But we suspect that around 1756 and later in 1754 BCE, expeditions are sent against the Assyrians, and ultimately the Assyrians are defeated. Now again, we wish we knew more about this, but while the Babylonian armies were definitely successful, Asher wasn't conquered. In fact, as far as we can tell, the royal dynasty of Assyria remains intact, and technically Assyria becomes a tributary power, paying this tribute to Babylon annually, but technically kind of being independent. With Larsha's fall, Hammurabi basically conquers the entirety of the old Sumeria region. With Mari's fall, he basically controls all the way to the borders of Syria. With Assyria's submission, he can basically lay claim to controlling the entire river valley. And it is at this point, in fact, that Hammurabi claims the title King of the Four Quarters of the World, another fancy way of saying King of the World. Well, Hammurabi will spend virtually the entirety of his reign at war with someone, say, the last couple of years. He wasn't just a warlord and a war leader. He's also a very astute politician at home, and he's known really as much for his political and legal reforms as he is for his conquests and empires. Because as we've mentioned, the empire he forged doesn't actually last that long, but many of the illegal and political ideas he hopes to create have a much, much longer lifespan. You see, the Babylonian Empire is really one of the first in which we can see what they call a feudal system of government that emerge. Now, feudalism is far more infamous or famous, whichever you prefer, in the European Middle Ages. The basic idea of a system of government based on personal relationships between a king 
and his various vassals and nobles and military commanders based on their loyalty and land or their privileges and obligations. We do know that during Hammurabi's reign, what are often called fiefs or plots of land called ilkun are in fact given to high-ranking officials, commanders, and their individuals. And the idea was that these plots of land, which could be significant in size, were given both as rewards for loyalty and service and rendered, but also in lieu of pay. You didn't get a salary from the king for being a governor or a general. You got land from the king. And in exchange for that land, you owed the king your loyalty and allegiance, and he, of course, swore to protect you and you know, yada, yada, yada. There's a couple of advantages and disadvantages that feudalism has compared to the previous model, the sort of large state secularism and governor model of the or three dynasty and the sort of outright Akkadian Empire model, though Akkadian also dabbled in feudalism. Feudalism has the advantage in that when you have these various vassal kings and nobles of these cities, they have an interest in actually making those cities more powerful, more defensible, and whatnot. And so it actually has a sort of decentralizing effect. You don't have to focus on every portion because the portions given out to those individuals are permanent. It's not like they'll be replaced in election. They will stand as so long as they're successful. But the flip side is, the more successful they are, the more powerful their fiefdoms become, the more rebellious and troublesome they can become. So it can actually develop into a very powerful model with one central ruler commanding many other powerful lesser rulers. But if the central ruler can't apply proper authority to keep his generals and lords in line, then all of a sudden that's a recipe for rebellion, usurpation, and pretender kings, and all that sort of thing. While Hammurabi is applying this feudal model on the highest levels, giving subsequent vassal kings and vassalizing military commanders and other high-ranking individuals, there's also other elements involved, too. Large elements of local rule and old traditions remain. There's still references in his documents and laws to town mayors, to councils of city elders, who still have some say in you know, policing and ruling and commanding cities, and villages, and other uh, regions. There's also talk about called the Karu, or Merchants Organization, which is really a throwback to the old guilds we talked about with the early Sumerian period, which still, again, have less power now, but are still players in local politics that Hammurabi recognizes as legal entities with standing in his nation. And more than that, whether it's out of a desire to avoid the pitfalls of feudalism, or just personal megalomania, Hammurabi also brings in elements of the old Akkadian and Eritrea system of royal inspectors and military governors and appointing judges of law courts to make sure that he could keep an eye upon his vassals. It's actually a, a fairly complex system, and at least during his lifetime and the reign of his immediate successor, it works reasonably well. But the pitfall of all this is it needs a strong king on top to actually function. Hammurabi also feels the need to legitimize his power to more than just the law of the sword, as is something referred to the law of the spear, as some also call it. He attempts to legitimize his power and Babylon's new position. Babylon, while an old city, is not one that's been prominent before. He declares that the patron god of Babylon, Marduk, is now the king of the gods, just as the king of Babylon is now the king of the earth. Now, he gets away with this partly by claiming, oh, it's not my decision. I was informed in a dream that Enlil is giving his crown to Marduk in, represent, in sort of honor of his achievements and what have you. I suspect in reality that Hammurabi made it stick because he had just finished killing all his rivals and beating everyone up when the king who'd done that says, my god's in charge now. No one was in a real position to rebel against that, and a few generations down the line, it just sort of sticks. Interestingly, this is not exactly the first time in Mesopotamian history when the King of the Gods has kind of gotten kicked down in rank. Enlil, who is often referred to as the King of the Gods, and seemingly was throughout the early dynastic and Sargonic, and more or less all the way up until this period, there are some indications that mythologically, who is often referred to as Father, Anu, may have been considered a more prominent god prior to the dynastic period, and seemingly Inanna might have actually been closer to the position of chief god, and there's some speculation that given how her name doesn't exactly match the linguistic patterns of early Sumerians, that she may have actually been a earlier god, maybe even a pre-Sumerian 
Sumerian culture kind of has tradition where gods will kind of flip depending on who is the one in charge. Of course, they're going to talk about Hammurabi, and I remember talking about him back in junior high school. This is a guy who's pretty well known in, in American history courses. The one element of his reign that really not only outlasts him, but really comes to define him for many is the so-called Code of Hammurabi, the law code that he dictates. That's partly because it's the only ancient law code we have in complete form. These were carved into stone pillars in some cases, and those pillars are found all over the region, as far east as Persia and uh, Susa, I believe, there was mm -hmm. one down there. And I think some pillars were found in Syria. It's basically the law of things now. It was called the first law code for until we found earlier fragments of earlier ones uh, later on. But what makes this interesting is, is that Hammurabi's code of law does seem to represent one of the first, if not the first, attempts to universalize law throughout a mass, disparate empire that consists of many different groups and traditions and you know, legal systems in the cities. Historians of previous centuries who had studied Hammurabi's law code hailed it as the first law code. But even more than that, they hailed it as well, to put it simply, they hailed it as an innovation in law. The first time that someone tried to codify law and write down what the laws are, what the punishments are, and distribute it universally all throughout his kingdom. We now know that's probably not really true. That this code of law is probably not as innovative as it originally seems. There's a concept in Mesopotamia called Mesharum. And that basically refers to this idea that there is a, a body of common law that exists that stretches back into the distant past. And each time a new king comes into power, he is supposed to reaffirm his dedication to upholding Nesharu. That's why so many uh, kings have inscriptions that he established law in his country. That means he publicly swore that he would uphold the traditional laws. We think big chunks of Hammurabi's law code are actually just the Mesharum of Babylon, but actually finally sort of rationalized and codified and written down in one place, which is somewhat similar to what the Emperor Justinian would do in Byzantine times, like in the Middle Ages. So this represents a sort of codification universal, the universalization of law, not creation, but it is still significant in a lot of ways. This is the first, or at least the first law code that we have, which really plays with the ideas of not just big crimes, but all kinds of crimes. It deals with everything from divorce to child care to fraud to murder to treason. It very closely talks about social status. Now, this is you know, a very archaic thing, but the social status of the criminal and the social status of the victim mattered very much in this law. You could get away with a lot more as long as you were victimizing someone who was important to you in the social structure. The other way around, and not so much. And some of these laws seem absolutely completely insane if you think about it. Like to read you a small sample of these. You know, if a surgeon performs a major operation and has caused the death of this man, they shall cut off his hand. If an architect builds a house for a free man but did not make his work strong, and if that house collapses and has caused the death of its owner, the architect should be put to death. If it has caused the death of a, of a slave of the owner, he should give a slave of his own to that household. If it causes the death of the owner's son, his son shall be killed. Which always seemed kind of bold for the builder's son. He didn't do anything wrong. The builder did crappy work. A fun fact that I learned about this is like, yeah, if, you, if you're a doctor, you kill a patient, you lose a hand. If you're a builder and kill a guy, you might get killed. But if you're a boat builder and your boat sinks, you just gotta build a new boat. Shrug. But the thing is, is that this law of retribution, which is kind of the core of a lot of Hammurabi's code, you know, it seems so draconian and brutal and bloody, and it certainly is. But if you actually dig deeper into the law code, it's maybe not so crazy as it appears. For example, and there are laws concerned with the protection of private property. There are laws concerned with the proper treatment of children. There are laws concerned with the proper circumstances for divorce. Like, for example, while divorce wasn't hard for a man to get, it was pretty hard for a woman to get, as it's pretty typical in ancient times. Nonetheless, you couldn't just randomly do it, and in fact, you were obliged to support your widow after your divorce. More than that, many of these laws also have addendums. Like, for example, the punishment for adultery is death. If the spouse who has been wronged wishes, they can spare. Well, usually it's called what the wife is mentioned. The husband can spare the wife, and the king can pardon the adulterer if he so chooses. 
And many of these cases have like, okay, well, you're supposed to do this at this crime, but there's leeway to commute the sentence. And how often was that done is hard to say. So the code isn't as clear cut as it seems, though it's still pretty bloody by modern standards. So when we look at Hammurabi's law code, despite all the caveats and the not necessarily being the most brutal it could be at all times, it does stand out when compared to some of the others. The Ur-3 law code is more, much more transactional and much more concerned with value and economy than is in retribution below. The New Testament laws are almost a direct re refutation of an eye for an eye in certain parts. So the question becomes, why is this law code so brutal? And it's not the only one like it. There are the Assyrian laws after the collapse. There is the short-lived but prominent uh, Draco laws in Athens, where we get the word draconian from. And so why is it that the Amorites and Hammurabi and the people of this area are down with this brutal code, whereas the civilization before it wasn't? It could be, possibly, that they simply lived in a different time, that they had seen a different sort of world where resources had grown scarcer. There is the proposed famine that brought an end to the Akkadians and an end to uh, Ur-3, as well as the Harappans. And in a sort of way, that's almost like a mini-run of the collapse that would come later. And in a period when resource wars are more common, when the cities are struggling more against each other, when you have these nomads coming out of Syria and out of Judea, and they're conquering large swaths of areas, and they're establishing their own kingdoms, and they're warring with each other, it's possible that it's just translated to more sort of violence toward one's fellow man. It's possible that just in this period when warfare was not only more common, but was more advanced, possibly more brutal because of the widespread nature and just the burning of cities and these large states run by individuals like Hammurabi and Shamshi Adad and whatnot. It's possible it's translated to in the streets that people were just more desperate, more willing to fight one another, and they wanted punishment for crimes. They wanted the ability to keep other people in line, essentially through the threat of state violence. The, the difference between Hammurabi's Code and Ur-3, not only its composition, but the fact that Hammurabi's Code more or less has staying power. It is referenced by future kings, it is restored, it is called upon, people prefer to maintain the laws, and they mean Hammurabi's laws. They want to enforce the code he laid down in their previous kingdoms, and it could indicate just the staying power of the culture being willing to accept this. It had just it had seen the violence of previous eras and seen the collapse, and it was willing to just live inside a society, willing to give the state the authority to carry out brutal punishments when it felt necessary. All right, so by the year 1750 BCE, Hammurabi is dead after some 42 years upon the throne, probably being pretty pleased with himself and the empire that he's carved and the legacy he's left behind. Unfortunately, as we have suggested before this, the empire he built is actually not that long-lived. He is succeeded by his son, Samsu Iluna, who will reign until about 1712 BCE. Now, Samsu Iluna, on the one hand, does seem to be cut from a very similar cloth as his father, and was a reasonably effective king for the earliest periods of his reign. However, by the end of it, things are beginning to accelerate, and things are beginning to mask the ultimate spell the end of the Babylonian Empire. Uh, for example, you saw the rise of the pretender king Rim Sin in the south, who would go on to establish that dynasty of the Sea Land that we mentioned. In addition to this, the king of the northern city of Eshnuna, who had been again subdued and forced to be a vassal of the Babylonians, decides that he no longer wants to be a vassal of Babylon in this period and breaks free, leading to a minor civil war. Now, Eshnuna is defeated, and in fact, the king of Eshnuna is publicly executed in Babylon for this crime, but no one had dared to revolt against Hammurabi, but they certainly dared against his son. An Elamite invasion also occurs during his reign, which leads to the sacking and widespread destruction in both Ur and Uruk, though those cities would recover from this. In fact, this is a particularly embarrassing invasion of the Elamites, because not only does Samsu Iluna fail to stop it and defeat it, not only does he allow two ancient and prominent cities to be sacked, the king of Elam carries off an ancient statue of Inanna from Uruk, one of the oldest artifacts of that temple, and they will hold on to it 
for the next thousand years. In fact, it takes the Assyrian king Ashurbanipal I, one of the great military commanders and total psychopaths of the era, to recover it. More than that, Urim Sin's Sealand dynasty, which claims sort of the southernmost portion of Mesopotamia as they call it the Neo Neo Sumerian Empire, that lasts until 1460 BCE, long after the Babylonian Empire itself collapses. This becomes a, a major power under Iluma Ilu, king there. By the time of Samsu Iluma's death, around 1712 BCE, there are four known successors that will reign until about 1595 BCE, but very, very little is actually known about them by their names. Abi Eshu, Ami Gitana, Ami Sadaka, Samsu Gitana. But other than names on a king's list, we really don't have any great achievements to their names. They spectacularly failed to end the Sealand dynasty, and in fact were kind of humiliated by that failure. The great empire of Babylon can't even defeat rebellious vassal states in the south. And there is also increased tensions with the north. This has to do with the fact that there are now, for the first time in history, there's actually some serious power players in the kingdom outside of Mesopotamia in this region. You see groups like the Kassites, the Mitanni, the Hurrians, the Hittites, the Hyksos, even the Egyptians that would actually start playing a role in Mesopotamian politics that they never had before. And Babylon, in this period of time, is just really ill-equipped to actually face these serious external threats. And despite pretender leading a revolt against Samsu Iluna, despite Iluma Ilu creating this you know, kingdom of Sumer, the dynasty of the sea land of the south, which holds Babylon at bay, it's not actually internal revolt which ultimately weakens Babylon, it's actually economic collapse. This is actually a really fascinating thing. We mentioned very briefly in previous episodes something called land salinization. It's a process by which irrigation over the centuries, if not done carefully and properly, which they didn't know there was a proper way to do it, deposits salt inside herbivores. By 1595 BCE, the very tail end of the Babylonian state, this land salinization is reaching a crisis. Some of the most fertile lands in Mesopotamia have begun to see significant drop-offs in productivity, and some of the more marginal lands have actually basically reverted to desert land. Of course, the whole thing actually snowballs. Increased land salinization means decreased fertility. Decreased fertility means decreased crop yields. Decreased crop yields mean increased fear of famine, as well as decreases in tax revenues for the state. This is a period in which money is being used, the silver shekel and things like that are currencies at this time. But crops are still the foundation of the economy and the societies. In desperation to try and recover their losses and grow more food, many farmers began to stop the practice of what's called fallow field. Now, if you know what that is, there was a practice in ancient times, really up until the early modern period, of farmers leaving part of their land uncultivated. It's called fallow, if you cultivate. The idea there was give the land a season to rest, rotate which part of your land is fallow each year, and that keeps fertility up. It works reasonably well as long as you're careful. With modern understanding of the proper rotation of fertilizers, we don't need to do that anymore, but it's an important part of agriculture in most of human history. But fallow field means the chunk of your land is not being planted. Normally, the farmers understood that was important. In fact, there was a law, I think, in the Code of Hammurabi about that, keeping part of the land fallow. In desperation, farmers planted anyway, and the state, desperate for tax revenue, stopped enforcing the law. Of course, not letting your fields recover that way means that that damages nutrition in other ways. The fields become even less fertile as a result of that. The whole thing gets even worse, despite all of this. It's actually very similar to the price collapse in the Great Depression, where farmers in desperation grew more food because the price was lower and drove the price further down in so doing. Same sort of thing. Mixed with the similar ecological disaster of the Dust Bowl during the Great Depression. Oh yeah, it's a whole big mess. So both farmers and the state increasingly had to basically take out loans to survive. So this is a period in which money is being used, transactions are happening, and private money lenders were a thing. The problem is, though, is that unlike modern banks, which have certain regulations on like, how they loan the interest rates they charge, a private lender could basically charge whatever they want. To use a modern phrase, these were Babylonian loan sharks. And there are records of them charging as much as 40% interest rates. If you didn't pay, those Amorites are going to break your knees. 
Well, they didn't necessarily do that, but there were provisions that debtors could be enslaved by their creditors if they couldn't pay back. A common way to avoid this was to sell their children instead, because, you know, why not? Which is why there are plenty of laws in the Old Testament about when and how you should enslave your children. It was actually a pretty big deal in the ancient world, uh, sadly enough, when even the state is being mired in debt to meet its bills, that just creates more economic problems. Because again, this is not a modern financial system that can actually manage debt. It just can't do that. It's like, actually like pre revolutionary France, in fact, unable to manage debt. In fact, there are several cases where kings actually offered blanket amnesties and actually just dissolving of debts. But of course, if you dissolve your debt, the money lender won't lend you anymore, and suddenly that becomes a problem too. The economy is circling the drain. The kings are having a hard time paying their armies, hard time maintaining public works. Famine is looming large and a fear of this ecological collapse of the land. And into this emerge a new people called the Hittites. So the Hittites of Turkey, under a king Mercilus, with the aid of Mitanni and a few other of these new nations in the north, a big Hittite army shows up in 1595 BCE, invades the Valley Empire, and basically gives the instruction, I want to loot everything. Or as I would say to my student times, Mercilus said, take everything that's not nailed down, and if you can pry it up, it's not nailed down. They just plundered the hell out of this region. They carried the statues of the gods out of Babylon itself and kept them captive. They actually gave them to Matani to charge a ransom for them. With this humiliating defeat, this, this unknown power of the north, in these barbarian lands beyond even Assyria, just crushed Babylon militarily, plundered it to the bones economically, and while the Hittites didn't stay, this wasn't a conflict, it was a raid with plunder. As George Rowe said so poetically, the dynasty of Hammurabi was brought to a humiliating end. And Babylon, though still an important regional power, an important center of culture, learning, and religion, ultimately becomes a fallen power, only to rise briefly again in the centuries to come, but to never again cast the shadow it once did in history. The thing that's really noteworthy after the ultimate decline of the old Babylonian Empire is that it's not another Mesopotamian power, even another Mesopotamian migrant power, that sort of becomes the new significant kingdom during this period. It's actually a number of outsiders, not just outside migrants like the Akkadians or the Amorites themselves, but powers and kingdoms outside of Mesopotamia begin to play a role. These groups include the Kassites, the Mitanni, the Hyksos, and, as we mentioned, the Hittites, the ones who would actually bring Babylon crashing down. But well, who are the Hittites? I mentioned that they were considered a, an unknown and barbaric peoples from the hills of Turkey before. So does that tell you anything? Well, probably not. They are outsiders in one of the purest senses in that not only are they foreigners to this region, they also speak a totally different language. Again, the Akkadians, the Amorites, the Gutians, and others all spoke a series of related so-called Semitic dialects. What Hittites represent is a new wave of peoples known as the Indo-Europeans. The reason they're called that is, this is another language group. In particular, this language group is the ancestor to the vast majority of languages spoken throughout Europe today, but also spoken in India, and also in the surrounding regions of the Middle East, like the Iranian Plateau and the like. Well, all right, if this group is so large and so significant and so widespread, well, who are they? where do they come from? turn back the clock really into the late Stone Age, you have to go back to the Caucasus or perhaps the southern Russian steppes, that relatively remote region which throughout history is kind of known for spawning a variety of tribal peoples that migrate and often cause significant disruptions in the area around them. The first to gain that honor we call the Kurgans. In fact, we call this the Kurgan Migration. A few of you old school listeners who ever watched the original Highlander movie might be aware of that word, but in actuality what Kurgan refers to uh, scientifically, that's not what they call themselves, it refers to a very particular type of burial practice. In other words, certain types of grave markers, certain types of graves, grave goods, and the likes. We call these Kurgan burials. And because they don't have you know, written records being left behind, we can track the material culture of their burials back and slowly trace the ancestral roots of the Indo-Europeans back into that, again, Caucasian, Southern Russian sort of area. 
It's hard to know exactly when this migration first began. Again, the Kurgan aren't keeping written records. They're a very early, very primitive people in this regard. But we do know, however, is that they were a very large group, and they split up into numerous branches and began moving outward relatively early in history, slowly creeping west, south, and southeast as they went. Pretty much any group you can think of famous in the ancient world. The Greeks, the Germans, the Vikings, even the Latin, the ancestors of the Persians, many people living in the Indian subcontinent, all ultimately can trace themselves back to this. The Kurgan groups moved into Turkey, perhaps as early as 2900 BCE. So again, we're talking the Bronze Age period here, but relatively early on, pre-Hammurabi. Now exactly when they moved isn't known, but we know from archaeological data, again looking at these grave styles, that by 2600 BCE, a number of Kurgan peoples are living in a region called Anatolia, basically the central part of Turkey. It's entirely possible this is not one group, in fact it's entirely possible it's multiple groups, several migrations, half a dozen or more tribes. But what they discovered upon moving into Anatolia was a, well, to them a paradise. Now, if you were to travel to Anatolia today, while it's still beautiful countryside, it's very rugged, very barren, very dry, it's desolate in some regions. However, that's mostly the result of human activity and ecological damage to the region. In ancient times, these would have been lush valleys, forested hills, and indeed, really pleasant places to be. We do know there were people living in this region before the Kurgan migrations, but very little is actually known about them. Though, again, we do find plenty of remnants of old agricultural settlements in these early cities there. However, whether it's through direct conquest or simply a long process of intermarriage and interbreeding and cultural emergence, these uh, Kurgan peoples merge with locals and ultimately what come to as the Hittites emerge out of this. Not only building a new culture and a new unique language, merging native ideas and languages with their own to create the Hittite language, they also found a variety of new cities. In fact, some of the most important archaeological sites for the Hittites, like Hattusas and Kanesh, we suspect are probably Kurgan settlements that were built by these peoples at this time. Asia Minor actually does host some of the oldest cities we are aware of. One of the most ancient Neolithic sites in a place that at least had semi-permanent habitation, perhaps peoples who migrated to various sources during different seasons but ultimately came back here for important times, perhaps sheltered during some of the harsher seasons, was Gobekli Tepe. It is a region that we don't know a ton about. There's been some speculation as to how advanced their culture was and whether or not a more advanced, civilized people were there than we get credit to. But the thing is, that's a little beyond our purview. The people of Gobekli Tepe did not have writing as far as we can know. There's no, there's no extant examples of it. And so as a result, we don't know what their culture was like. We don't know if they were even the same people that, was, that were encountered by the Hittites when they came to power. Like, there were... Sites are considered extremely ancient that even fall into the area between them. The city of Chatalhayuk was roughly equivalent to Sunni culture. It existed in the 6th millennia BCE. This is a pre rook city, perhaps one that they would have traded with at the time. It has example of obsidian working. We don't even know if the Chatalhayuk people were the same people ethnically and linguistically as what was encountered by the Hittites. This is a place that has a very ancient culture, but unfortunately... We're not 100% sure who was there when and what connections were made and what those people were like. What we do know, however, is that in this mixing pot of various native groups, like the Hatians, the Luwians, the Gasca, the Seha, the Luka, and various other groups that are mentioned in Hittite records, the Kurgan peoples merged with them and a group that called themselves the Hittites came out of this. Again, a unique language that is primarily Indo-European, but blends a lot of native terms and ideas into it, also blends religious ideas. Many Indo-European groups, again, whether we're talking Greeks or early Germanic peoples or the Northmen or even the, uh, the early ancestors of the Indians, seem to worship a very similar set of gods, mostly gods of lightning and thunder, skies and storms, things like that, are very common among these groups. The Hittites are no exception. Well, what makes them interesting though is this. One of the things that really differentiates Hittite culture as it would emerge from Mesopotamian culture isn't just its language. See, the language is radically different. It's how society is organized. As we mentioned you know, in the first episode, one of the key motivations for the Mesopotamians was controlling of water and agriculture. We call it hydraulic civilization because they had to build these 
massive water control and flood control and irrigation systems to survive. The Hittites don't. In central Anatolia, it's called the Lake District, there's abundant soil, there's abundant lakes and small rivers, abundant annual rainfall. They're practicing agriculture much more like what they practiced in the American Midwest in the early 18th and 19th centuries. So it's not good farmland that they are really looking for, because it's everywhere. What they're looking for is resources. Their cities don't emerge around good agricultural land. Their cities emerge around plentiful mineral deposits primarily, also lumber sources, but minerals are the big thing, because Turkey is vastly wealthy in mineral resources, and especially important for the ancient world, it is vastly wealthy in copper, one of the key points of bronze making. In fact, copper is so plentiful in Anatolia, it's still being mined there to this day, which gives you an idea of the source of this. It's looking at early either Hittite-built cities, or ultimately Hittite-ruled cities in later periods, they're not built around temples, they're not built around irrigation systems, they're built mostly around oh, early castles, large hill forts, and similar structures. It becomes pretty obvious that not only is this a culture that placed a great emphasis on the military, or at least the military leadership of its leaders early on, but also was building its cities with a certain strategic eye toward protecting in particular, the mineral resources that they possessed, and also protecting the various trade routes that branched out from their cities. In fact, the earliest records we have of this region are mostly economic and trade records, talking about the movement of copper and tin and bronze and stone and timber and silver and various other highly valuable minerals and metals. Indeed, we actually think that government structure in Anatolia didn't emerge as a necessity for protecting water, but as a necessity for safeguarding trade and securing strategic mineral resources. For the longest time, there really wasn't anything resembling unified Hittite culture, politically speaking. There are perhaps dozens of petty kingdoms and city-states and minor principalities, and even some tribal groups still, with their own kings and leaders and cities doing their own things, launching petty wars and raids against each other, and more or less you know, existing much as the Mesopotamians had done in the earliest period of their society. What brought unity, ironically enough, was again economics. Economics plays a hugely important role in Hittite history. You see, around the year 1940 BC, so you know, some 600 and some odd years after we know the Hittites were building cities and forts and mines, the Assyrians come. But it's conquerors as traders. During this period of history, the Assyrians were sending out merchant colonies, not literal colonies in the modern sense of building new cities and nations, but more of groups of traders going out and looking for their societies, establishing outposts and trade posts and merchant quarters in their cities, and basically conducting long-distance trade between those two empires. The Assyrians were looking for copper, and so they came to Anatolia to find it, and they found the Hittites. And rather than fight over it, because of really, realistically speaking, that was too far away to fight over, really, they instead decided to trade for it, because the Assyrians had access to something the Hittites very much wanted. That's tin. Because, see, the Assyrians weren't just going into Anatolia for copper, they were also sending merchants as far east as Afghanistan to get tin from local groups there who were mining it in the mountains. Tin is still very plentiful in Afghanistan, though much harder to exploit than uh, Turkish copper due to the uh, modern instability in that region. If you look at the way the Assyrians are essentially building merchant quarters and establishing themselves inside pre-existing societies and trading with them, most likely ingratiating themselves with whatever ruling class was present in that region or whatever commercial ties were there, it's very similar to the way Uruk likely was doing that earlier when they were the trading uh, hyperpower of the River Valley. And if you look at this historical timeline where Rook early on monopolized the creation of agriculture and the distribution of crops and used that as the primary way to trade, when you've got a southern trade partner who has capitalized the market a thousand years or more before on grain as a means of exchange, you don't worry about uh, cultivating grain. That's why easily lumber and minerals could have been the Hittites' way to make a profit because they were never going to compete with the Rook and the Sumerian River Valley in that case. Yes, they're very old tradition in the region. But see, the Assyrians did more than just trade tin and copper. The Assyrian merchants, like, they built quarters in Hittite cities. They stayed there. They intermarried with locals. Some even gave their children Hittite names. 
In fact, if it wasn't for the clay tablets found in Assyrian there, we probably wouldn't know they were Assyrians. They brought culture with them. As from the Assyrians, the Hittites learned literacy, adopting the cuneiform alphabet themselves, which was a very, very awkward fit for their language. In fact, they'd ultimately abandoned it in favor of their own hieroglyphic alphabet in centuries to come, but they learned literacy, learned mathematics. They learned advanced architectural techniques, probably advanced metalworking techniques. Interestingly enough, the Hittites were such good pupils, Anatolia became the bronze smelting center of the ancient world. In fact, Anatolian bronzes were so noted for their high quality and durability that, in fact, it was a status symbol to own them in Mesopotamia. Fun facts, now, not a lot of old metal artifacts survive because the ancient world was big on recycling, actually. But we know chemically the Anatolians were mixing a lot more tin than the Mesopotamians were because they had access to more of it. So their bronzes were actually harder. In fact, chemically, if they're studied, anything above 5% up to 15% tin, probably a Hittite bronze. Not guaranteed, but a pretty good indication of that. This also shows, once again, like we talked about before, the way technology and ideas spread. Essentially, Assyria in the old days was a great source of materials. The ideas of the River Valley of Sumer spread to them. They adopted it. They, even in this period, actually are speaking Akkadian. It's an Assyrian variant of Akkadian that they use in their writing. And as Assyria develops and they become more centralized, the Hittites and Turkey become the frontier region. And all of a sudden, you have that same Sumerian culture being spread by the people who were spread to before. We know that both powers were enriched greatly by this, and the Hittite kings, who were fortunate enough to have Assyrian merchants, became basically the big political and economic centers of the region, mostly subdued their more primitive surrounding cities, and began to slowly consolidate their power. But something happened. Around the year 1780 BCE, for reasons that really aren't 100% understood, the Assyrian trade network would stretch from central Turkey all the way to Afghanistan and down to the Persian Gulf, collapses almost overnight. Some historically blamed Hammurabi, which he, this was his era, but he's only been on the throne for about 12 years. He hasn't launched any wars against Assyria yet. The idea that he's responsible is probably incorrect. We just don't know. The Assyrians don't really record what happened, but we do know from Hittite records that suddenly the Assyrian merchants are gone. The best guess we have is that a group called the Hurrians were migrating into the region of northern Mesopotamia at the time, and they might have been responsible for disrupting the trade, but we really, again, we really don't know. It's hard to get from point A to point B when horse riding nomads are in your way. It is a little difficult. What we do know, though, the Assyrians could get their copper from other sources, like Oman or even Egypt. The Hittites didn't really have another source of tin. In fact, a uh, historian named J.G. McQueen, who wrote extensively on the Hittites, did a huge study over where potential tin sources were there. And he basically put out there weren't a lot of options. Egypt, again, has small quantities of tin, but that's not really convenient for the Hittites to get. There's small amounts we found in Eastern Europe, but there are no civilizations in Eastern Europe at this time who are seriously mining tin. Some have theorized that, well, maybe they went as far away as Italy, which they would have had access to the Mediterranean, but again, that's pretty moot as well. Some have theorized that possibly, somehow, there was a trade connection, or maybe even the famous tin mines of Cornwall. Cornwall had their product and somehow made it to the Hittite lands. That seems highly dubious in this period. Yeah, as, uh, as the Queen pointed out, the only really reliable source of tin that the Hittites, yeah, the Hittites would have really known about and really would have guaranteed they could exploit were the Mesopotamian sources imported mostly from Afghanistan still. As was mentioned, and as I've said to students before, to a Bronze Age civilization, bronze was as vital to them as oil is to us today. Without it, they are in serious economic trouble. So what do you do? Well, there's not a lot of options. But at some point, we're not really sure the exact year, but at some point, a king named Hattusilis came to power in the city of Hattusis. In fact, he's named for the city. His name means the man from Hattusis. He decides on a military solution. He, very successfully, and unfortunately his own records kind of gloss over how he did this because, well, like a lot of ancient kings, he's building a mythology for himself as well, but he forcefully unifies the half a dozen or so major Hittite cities in Anatolia and forges the first real Hittite kingdom. And with the material and ultimately the manpower resources of this kingdom, 
he's in a position to launch perhaps one of the most desperate but also greatest endeavors their civilization can take to conquer the entirety of Asia Minor or Turkey as we call it today, forcibly kick open what are called the Cilian Gates and gain access once again to the vast market of Mesopotamia. It would not be an easy task. During his reign, he dies around the year 1750 BCE, he was successful at least partially. He did unify the Hittites under his reign. This is an example of a war for survival in some ways. The average person might not have grasped the complexities of it, but you better believe the various elites certainly did. He launches wars against the Hurrians to the east. That's a really difficult front. There are many wars, many reverses there, but he eventually does force them back out of the Taurus Mountains and basically secures the eastern frontiers and the copper mines there. He forces various, basically hill and river tribes as they're called, living in the fringes, the Gaska people to the northern parts of Turkey, the Seha and Luka peoples to the west. He forces them to either accept his kingship or he drives them out of their ancestral land and conquer the areas they, uh, they once dwelled in. Some even believe he might have had contact with and perhaps even warred with the Greeks. This is not 100% known, mind you, but there's references to a coastal power in western Turkey called Ahiyawa, which the Hittites mention having dealings with, trading with, and occasionally warring with through various rivals and other peoples. Now, the location would be right for Greek colony. We know the Mycenaeans and the Noans were active all along that region in terms of founding colonies and cities and trading of their own. Also, we know that the earliest Greeks are often referred to in their own records as the Achaeans. There's thought that maybe Ahiyawan is a Hittite corruption of the word Achaean. There's not 100% evidence of this, but this would line up pretty neatly with the timeline of the Trojan War, which was a major economic city in Asia Minor at this time that the Mycenaeans did go to war with, although the exact specifics of the Trojan War a little fuzzy archaeologically, and we're, we're pretty confident it wasn't fought over a woman. We're pretty confident the gods didn't come down and batter gates down, and there wasn't a giant wooden horse. Reality is often much less interesting than fiction, but the war probably did happen. Next year, tell me Gilgamesh actually wasn't two thirds god. Well, I haven't seen the paternity results, but I'm pretty confident he wasn't. We don't think the war was fought against the Hittites, per se. This is perhaps a, a sort of pre-Hittite or proto-Hittite group, but whatever. We think that is definitely some evidence that the early Greeks and the early Hittites had contact, but the exact extent of this really isn't recorded. All of this sort of paled in comparison to Hattusilis' most important campaign. There's a region, a mountain pass, in southern Turkey, which leads down to Syria, called the Cilician Gate. It's a very important region because it's one of the few really good routes to move to the mountains down to that region. And a professor of mine once told me that it was actually so strategically important, but also so difficult to hold, that even as late as the 1970s, the Turkish army wouldn't go in there without heavy armor support for fear of, like, mountain bandits. And the Cilician Gates, they occupied it and they fortified it, and that basically gave them a route into Syria. Unfortunately, there are a number of powerful groups there, like the city of Aleppo, Carchemish, and a variety of other powers. Some of these are Kassite powers, some of these are Hurrian powers, things of that nature. And Hattusilis dies before he can complete this campaign. But under the reign of his grandson, Marsilis, he is actually able to succeed in this. He reaches out to a Kassite power, one of the groups who's mighty in this region called Hana, and he basically says, hey, I would like to conquer Aleppo. Aleppo has been a rival of you as well. Let us join hands and beat them up together. And the king of Hana, who was much weaker than Aleppo and the Hittites as well, was like, you'd like to help me break my most important rival in this region in exchange for basically nothing else? Awesome, let's do this. And so together, the uh, Hittites and the kingdom of Hana, over the course of a number of different sieges and all kinds of battles and several wars, including what one professor called a war of fortification, where the Hittites basically fight to control strategic resources and regions and fortify them, basically tighten the noose around Aleppo, and eventually the gates fall, the city falls, and with Aleppo's fall, and now a Hittite outpost, yeah, Marcellus, by some accounts, places a son of his as king of Aleppo, the trade route, the overland route, old route through Mari, is now open into Babylon itself. The Hittites can now import tin from that route once again. But, something changes. 
You see, Hana, its sort of ambitions, if you will, whetted by its success against Aleppo, appeals to Marcellus. They say, the greatest prize of all still lays before us. Babylon is defenseless. It is broken. It is weak. We are powerful. Let us go there together and crush them. And indeed, the king's ears are swayed by this. And in 1595 BCE, the great Babylonian raid happens. And of course, the Hittites plunder the area. Hana also plunders it. Even some Kassites get involved. Everyone's having a party, feasting on Babylon's bones. On the eve of what should have been the Hittites' greatest glory, the completion of their conquest of Anatolia, the completion of the conquest of Syria, the opening of the vital trade routes, the humiliation of Babylon, the former great power of the age, their nation begins to decline. You see, Marcellus had made a mistake. He had kept the majority of his army away from home for too long. And a combination of palace intrigues, as well as some unrest among the peoples he had conquered outside Hittite, uh, Hittite homelands, ultimately mean that when he returns, he faces wars and usurpers and pretenders, and ultimately he vanishes into history, and his nation's gains are lost almost as soon as they are gained. In this power vacuum of the first Hittite decline, because unlike with other powers, the Hittites will recover them. Several new ones begin to emerge. The first is kind of an old one, Egypt. Now, Egyptian history is, of course, very long and co uh, complicated on its own. But one of the groups I mentioned as being a new power of this age is a group called the Hyksos, other chariot slash horse nomadic people who, unfortunately, not a whole lot is really known about them. They actual their origins, their culture, and their ultimate fate is all kind of a mystery largely thanks to the Egyptians, in fact. What we do know is during the same period in which the Hittites are beginning to establish themselves in power, the Hyksos sweep into Egypt and basically conquer it. Now, to the Egyptians, this is a time of oppression and terror when these godless outsiders who, to quote the Egyptian text, ruled without Ra's blessing, held the land in their thrall from their great fortresses and enslaved the Egyptians, etc., 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 from the few Hick Hyksos texts we do find, it seems more like the Hyksos made themselves pharaohs and kind of basically ruled more or less like pharaohs, but they didn't assimilate into the culture as effectively as, say, the Akkadians had done the Sumerians or the Amorites had done the Akkadians, and so the Egyptians had always resisted them. And after a series of revolts and rebellions, including some pretty hilarious ones, this is uh, getting ahead of myself, but there was a man named Sekhmun Ra, a, a would-be pharaoh who fought the Hyksos, who is called the ever victorious one in his epitaph. His mummy, when found, was riddled with arrows and had several spear wounds and a crushed skull. We're pretty confident he was not ever victorious. But by the time the Hittite collapsed, the Hyksos have been defeated, driven out. The Egyptians claim they were destroyed utterly. Probably more likely they fled back into the Mesopotamian area, kind of banished into the cultures there. Though, from this point onwards, every Egyptian ruler, up through including Julius Caesar and Augustus Caesar, will swear eternal hatred of the Hyksos as part of their oath as the new ruler of Egypt. So yes, they held a grudge. Nothing like Billy National Legend, like really hating shit out of the <laughs> And basically glorifying what to modern eyes is basically genocide. Under a, a powerful pharaoh named Tutmos III, Egypt began a new imperial policy. Partly driven by the trauma of the Hyksos, the desire to never again be dominated by foreigners, but also partly driven by greed, because the Hyksos had shown just how mighty a conquering civilization could become, Tutmos decided that Egypt needed an empire of its own. And he led his forces out beyond the Sinai Peninsula, really for the first time in history, beyond you know, trade and nomadic expeditions, and conquered what's today the Syria-Palestine region. The great capstone of this? The fortified city of Aleppo, that the Hittites had bled so much to take. In fact, the Hittite kings of this era ruling their rump state in Anatolia, were actually forced to pay tribute to the Egyptians to keep the peace, a humiliation that they themselves will also never forget. But at the same time, which the Egyptians are beginning to sort of stretch their imperial muscles for the first time, and the Hittites are scrambling to preserve whatever they can of their nation, other groups are emerging in Mesopotamia, groups like the Mitanni, a group of Hurrians, another migratory people moving in this time, basically revitalized the city of Mitanni and capitalize upon Hittite weakness to expand their own power into Syria and southern Anatolia. But more importantly, a new people that I mentioned as well, the Kassite out of Iran, they begin to move into the region in large numbers, and it is they who become the dominant power of Mesopotamia for a time. 
This episode ended up being significantly longer than we expected. So instead of just combining to one mega episode, we're going to go ahead and go easy on ourselves and just cut in two. So tune back to the second one and we'll finish up all the things we talked about here. Thanks for your time. This has been episode three of our series of Mesopotamia. Thank you for listening. You can find us on soundcloud.com slash the history hour or the history hour on YouTube. And you can follow us at the history hour on Twitter. And if you just love our series, you can find us on Patreon.